it's 2020, and perhaps you, like many people, have thought of a few things that you might focus on. <clears throat> Paul, can you take my mic off just for a second? And you've thought of a couple of things maybe that you would like to work on in the next year. You would not be alone in that. Many of us do New Year's resolutions. Things we'd like to focus on, like, you know, I'd like to lose a little weight. Well, that's kind of mine. I'd like to just lose a little bit. And went down yesterday into, a, we have an exercise room. If you saw my exercise room, you would think, John, you have no excuse. No excuse. And so over the years, I've had different pieces of equipment that are really fancy um, things to hang clothes on. It's what they really are. <laughs> but you can do other things with them, like actually exercise. But we went down there. We were working on that, re you know, kind of arranging, cleaning up, you know, all of that. So I have no excuse now. It's ready to go. Well, it's pretty close. And, but there's all, you have resolutions like that. Some people do resolutions like I'd like to read a book maybe this year or a book a month or whatever it is, but some people want to read more, which is a great thing to do, and other people want to work on uh, maybe having daily devotions, like this will be the year I'm going to have daily devotions, I'm going to try to do that, which is a great, great idea. It's interesting, too, when you, if you Google the number of people that want to do a resolution about relationships, like they would like to improve a relationship with perhaps coworkers, relationships within their family, maybe it's a sibling, relationship with their spouse. And it was, it's this idea that I was reading one of the surveys and the idea of how you can make your relationships better that really is kind of prompting this whole idea that is the theme of this message. And the number one uh, with a significant other person in your life, the number one thing that they wrote down to improve your relationship is put limits on your phone use. And I can't tell you how many times I've heard in the back of my mind, um, times my children or Leanne has said, can you put that phone down for just a little bit? And I, I do, but then it's like my hand reaches for it, you know. <laughs> um, they say the other thing that we can do is designate a time each day to connect. Commit to doing something together at least once a month, something spontaneous or fun. Schedule monthly, catch this, money talks. 73% of the people, they said, struggle with money in couples, and so they said, you, sh you should talk about it on a monthly basis. I thought about this. That would just create a monthly argument for a number of people. <laughs> so I don't know about this. The other interesting one was, they said in a significant relationships that you should practice gratitude on a daily basis. In other words, looking for ways to say thank you or I really appreciate this, noticing what uh, in that relationship somebody has done for us, just noticing that. And so yesterday, I want you to know that all by myself, or the day before, actually it was the day before, all by myself, it was Friday night, I went to the grocery store and I bought a package of mushrooms, like the real ones. Well, there's really not fake mushrooms, but anyways. <laughs> They're not in a can. They were in a package. And, and Jason Kurth, who goes to our church, he had given me this stuff that you put inside the mushroom. So I went home. I took the, I cleaned them. This is, what I, this is what I messed up in the first service. I said, I put them in, a, in coriander. No, a colander. But I couldn't get that word. <laughs> and everybody's laughing, but I don't get it. So I put them in a colander and washed them down. I took the stems out. I took a sharp knife and I kind of carved out the very top. And then I put this, this filling in there that Jason had given me and baked them for 20 minutes at 350 degrees. And I took them out and they were phenomenal. I am all by myself. This happened. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. It was a significant moment in my life. <clears throat> my wife comes home. I said, oh, by the way, I said, there's some leftover mushrooms. They turned out phenomenal. They're in the refrigerator. And so she goes over, and she pulls one out. She didn't even heat it up. She just popped it in her mouth, and she says, 
man, that's really good. It's really good. I said, I know. Did it all by myself. So she calls Jason, who had made this recipe the, a few days before that on New Year's Eve, and she says, Jason, guess what John just did? Made, made, this, you know, made this. And Jason writes back, he didn't do it. I gave him the whole thing. Well, she didn't know that. <laughs> so now she kind of takes back the thank you and the appreciation for what I had done as though I hadn't really accomplished anything. Well, again, it just whacked away at my self-esteem. And, and so, and then, then she says, you know, by the way, if you were able to do that, how about we do this? How about once a week we have John's cooking night? <laughs> Which is, listen, that wouldn't be a bad thing, would it? I, I should be able to do that. So, um, not the, well, I, she's in the service, so I gotta be careful what I promised. <laughs> we'll talk about it, dear. Um, but this whole idea of relationships in a purpose, I want you to kind of keep that in the back of your mind because I want to show you something I think that is so critical in how we live our life with God and this invitation about understanding our purpose can only really come from the idea that we understand God's role in our life and what God has wanted to do. And I have to take you back to... A, a, some scripture that I actually preached during the Christmas services, not Christmas Eve, but during that whole series in Advent, because there was a phrase that caught my attention, and I, I kind of spoke a little bit about it, but it started my ideas on this, and it, and it begins here. The angel is speaking to the shepherds that this Messiah has been born in Bethlehem. He says, don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will be great joy to all the people. So in other words, this news is not just for you shepherds that we're proclaiming this to, but it's not just also to the Jewish people in the area. Remember, we're only five miles away, Bethlehem, about six miles actually from Bethlehem to uh, Jerusalem. So it's not just for you Jew Jewish people here. It's really for everyone. It's for the entire world. This good news of great joy for the entire world, we're letting you know. And here, then it goes on, it says, and you will recognize him by this sign. And it was that phrase that really kind of stuck in my mind. Because here, here's the sign. You'll find a baby wrapped in snugly, snugly in strips of cloth lying in a manger. And now that would make sense to a shepherd, a manger. They probably knew all of the mangers around the Bethlehem area and could easily go check out and find which one where the Savior was, where Jesus was born. But it is this idea that God has given us signs. That I believe that God is actively giving us signs in our lives to draw him closer to us. It wasn't just so the shepherds could go out. Let's pretend like the shepherds had cell phones. It wasn't just to go out to the manger scene and take a picture and be able to show everybody, hey, here's where Jesus was born and uh, this is really a, a significant moment. You know, I saw all the people Last night, when the, I hate to say this if you're a Patriots fan, but when the Patriots got beat last night, I noticed that when Tom Brady walked off the field, that a number of people that obviously knew the stadium well got down by where he went into the tunnel area, and they were all there with their cameras taking this, because thinking that this might be the last time he's in a New England Patriots uniform. And so they were trying to capture that moment. It's not that... that these angels wanted just the shepherds to capture the moment. It's not just about capturing a moment. It's really about that God wants more than anything else for the shepherds as well as all the people to experience the joy of a relationship with Jesus. That's really what matters. And I see this coming out in the story where the Bible begins with the Garden of Eden and Adam and Eve are in there, and they've blown it. They ate of the fruit that they were forbidden not to. God had told them, if you eat of this, you'll surely die. And then it's very interesting, as though God does not know. Look at this verse in Genesis 3, 9. Then the Lord God, God called to the man, where are you? Where, where are you? Adam, Eve, where are you? Where are you? And so he's calling out to them, where are you? You see, here's this idea. 
I'm going to give you a sign. This is a sign where you can find him. I'm, I, I'm calling out to you, so to the shepherds, to this, and then when you begin to follow this through, you can see through so many stories within the scriptures that God is the one that is pursuing. Why is God calling out? He, he knows where they are. As though God, who had created every tree in the Garden of Eden and everything that's there, did not know where they were hiding. But there they are hiding. Where are you? God is always pursuing. Remember Jesus said the story, man has a hundred sheep and he loses one. Does he not leave the 99 and look for the one? Again, God's showing that I am the one who pursues. So there have probably been times in your life where there have been signs where God has really gotten a hold of your heart, it could have been at a movie. It could have been um, when you were walking out on a beach somewhere. It, it could have been in the midst of an argument that as you tried to work through that, you felt God's presence. It could have been at a funeral. It could have been at, that, at a funeral where, where you, were, you were touched and you begin to think about your mortality. But there have been times in our life, I think, where God has given us those signs where God is trying to indicate to us and help us to realize that I pursue you. I am pursuing you all the time. In fact, it says this in 1 John. We love each other because he loved us first. In other words, God loved us first. He says, you, you only love each other because I loved you, that I cared for you, that I was there for you that I've helped you. And this idea uh, about relationships and the importance of it really comes out in a passage which I've chosen to do out of Ephesians in the message version. And what I want you to see is that God wants us to understand this relationship with him. That it is, per, it is really driven out of love and not out of anger. If you ask sometimes young people to draw a picture of God, they sometimes draw a picture of God sitting in a, a big chair, almost kind of like a judge. And though God will judge, that, that is true in the end, but he, he is, while we're alive, he is pursuing us out of love. And some people, I think, listen to the enemy and his remarks in their mind, which would try to sever us from the relationship. So listen to this passage in in Ephesians as we go down through this and try to understand this idea that God is pursuing us. Long before the earth's foundations, long before the Grand Canyon existed, long before the oceans and the waves were forming, long before that, he had us in mind. We were on his mind. He had settled on us you and me, we could put our name in there, as the focus of his love. You will be the focus of my love. Made in the very image of God, we are now the focus of love before one day of your life existed. Before you were born, before you had time to breathe, God said, no, I will be the focus of your love. To be made whole and holy by his love. Now, notice how it began. In 1-4, long before. Now watch 1-5. Long, long ago. Now you want to know where Star Wars got their whole beginning? Right here. <laughs> he decided to adopt us into his family through Jesus Christ. So in other words, he says before the foundations were ever made in this earth, we had already chosen through Christ, see so he says through Christ, to adopt us into his family. So it's like God could see our life, he could see our sin, the difficulties, the challenges of our life, and he chose then to adopt us. It was not in our finest moments that God said, oh man, you've done a phenomenal job, I would love to adopt you, come into heaven. It's not that. It is in the midst of the difficulty, the challenge, the, <coughs> the hard times, that he looks at our life and he says, I, I already chose to adopt you. Maybe you've had... Um, kind of it's exciting to go and pick out a puppy and you go and you look at however many puppies are before you and you're like well which one would you should we choose and it might be color that's kind of the indicator for you 
It might be the behavior. Some people will do behavioral tests for puppies to see which one might match up what they're looking for. My, my brother, their last litter of puppies, this was um, her first litter, 16 puppies. So they had to help her, you know, uh, with food and, and helping these puppies to nurse. They, they had to help them. 16 puppies is a lot of puppies. And I said, are you able to keep it? He says, we've, we've kept them all. And, but you know, you know how it is when you have, uh, you know, having raised pigs, you know, sometimes if, if, if a sow had a, a lot of pigs, you know, there's always going to be one that's what? A runt. Now here's the thing about the runt. They never do good, do they? In other words, they're always smaller. They, they don't get enough milk. They're, they're, they're smaller. They don't do as well. Their health is not as good. They're runts. And sometimes, and I hate to tell you this, especially, um, but on the farm, sometimes you had to make a decision. We're not going to go any further than that. You know what I mean. And, and those were always hard decisions to make for a farmer. I don't know that we can do this. There's just too many. And this was obviously the runt, and they're weak, and what are you going to do? And it's like somebody, if you can imagine if you were, you were going out to buy a, a purebred dog, and you were going to pay a significant amount of money for this dog, and you came in, and the first thing you said to the breeder was, you know what, we're looking for a runt. Do you have one? Has anybody ever chosen, you know, people, now, nowadays when you get some of these dogs, you, you get in a, an order. So in other words, the first person that put the deposit down, they get first choice. Can you imagine first choice comes in? Maybe you're going to spend 1000 or $2,000 on this dog, and somebody comes in and says, you know what, um, we're looking for the runt. Well, you have first choice. Yeah, but I want the runt. It wouldn't be that way. You, you would think, well, you're crazy. It doesn't make any sense. And yet, is that not what God is doing? He says, I want to adopt you in, and here's the news. You're all runts. In other words, we have done nothing to look to God and say, hey, look at me, because look at what I've accomplished. No, God is saying, no, your righteousness is as filthy rags. You're kind of a runt. But here's the good news. I love runts. I want you with me forever and ever and ever. I want to adopt you. So here's the thing. The enemy comes in, and he'll tell you this. You know, really, 2019 wasn't a really great spiritual year for you. As far as that reading the Bible thing, not much happened. And you know, God probably isn't that really impressed with how you live your life. So why don't you just give up? Why don't you just forget about it? And when the enemy can sever the relationship, when the enemy can focus on us being able to think that God would be angry with us, would not want us with him at all, in other words, he can sever that relationship at that point so that all of a sudden we stop looking at the pursuit of God in our life as coming from love rather that we see God pursuing us for, for vindication or for punishment or judgment into our life. When you begin to switch that around, then you begin to do exactly what Adam does, which is avoid God. If you think that God is coming after you to punish you, then you will avoid God. Avoid church, avoid devotions, avoid reading the Bible, avoid prayer. God's just out there. He's so distant from me. He doesn't really care about me. I mean, look at the mess that I'm in my, in, in my life. Where you know I don't really know that God's there. And when you begin to switch this all around like that, the enemy begins to win. But what God is trying to tell us through this, and through, if you look at a number of ver never different verses, is that God is always pursuing, and it's about love. Now remember, on Christmas Eve, I, 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 I did the story of the prodigal son. Now, you know, he wastes all the money. He comes back to his father. He comes all the way back to his father, and he's there. And, and his father runs to him, seeing him from a distance. What Jesus is trying to say is that's how we view him. We're not coming there to say, look what you've done. We're saying, come on, you're in the family. Let's go. Let's move in this direction out of, out of love. So God is motivating completely out of love to reach us because he says, listen, I adopted you. I signed the papers for your adoption in my blood 
on a cross. I love you. So you might have blown it spiritually. You might have blown it spiritually this last week. And the thing that you think about the worst is that, is that you, I, I don't want to really face God. I, I don't want to do anything with it. I'm here because i got to kind of be here with my family. But I, it's not like I choose to be here on my own. I mean, have you, have you ever had, have you ever had an argument with someone that you love a lot? I mean, you really love that person, and then you chose in your mind to give them the silent treatment. Have you ever done that? Don't really raise a hand or anything like that. Now, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be honest with you. There have been a time or two in my life. Um, Leanne's not as perfect as you think, by the way. Is she gone? She's gone, isn't she? She did. She slipped out. So let's be honest now. <laughs> she, she is so close to perfect, it's frustrating. But there have been times when I've been somewhat upset at her, and, and, and this is what I think, right in the car. I'll just show her. I'm not talking today which is really hard for someone like me. I mean, that's really torture. I'm not going to talk. And then, and then I think, well, maybe, maybe, if it hasn't gotten any better, then, well, maybe I'll just continue that another day. Now, listen, be honest with you. How stupid. How, John, act like an adult. Now, that, is, thankfully, is very rare in my life, but, uh, but there are those temptations to this. Well, what does that do? Does that ever help the relationship? Now, sometimes you might need a little time away from each other. Just to cool down a little bit. But trying to repair and to move back because it's a relationship. That's, that's what it's, it's all about a relationship. The same thing is true with God. If somehow God can get us, the enemy can get us to the point where we're frustrated, where, where we, we don't begin to communicate with God anymore, well, then he wins. He severs the thing and brings it down so you can still kind of come to church and go through the motions. But that's not what God's about. He's about adopting us as his children to live with him. So that begins to look quite a bit differently than just simply going through the motions. He's saying, I want to have this relationship with you. Can you take me down to Ephesians 1.11? It's in Christ that we find out who we are and what we're living for. It's only in that love that we can find it. He's in that same passage right here. He says, I, I want to tell you something. He says, if you don't begin with this idea that God, wants, that God has already chosen to adopt you, if you don't understand that you are in the family, if you don't understand that, you begin to get this distorted view of God. I remember our oldest son one time. He was only like two or three years old. We went to a store at that time would be like Dillard's or something like this. And he, for whatever reason, got the idea that he could run into that store, into that circle of clothes, clothes that are all hung there in a circle, and dive in there and come up in the middle, and we wouldn't know where he was. Well, we didn't. We would start to call out, Jordan, where are you? And the moment you turned your back on him, he, was, he dove into another one. Now, what he was doing in there was taking off all the sizes, that, the little knobs that were on the hangers. So when I, came, when I looked at him, I, his pockets were full. I said, well, Jordan, what's in your pockets? And he had all of the sizes. He had a lot of them in his pockets. And I said, you can't do that. I said, people won't know what size to pick up. So we, we wanted to give those back. So I thought he, he knew, learned his lesson. Well, we got home. And even though he, we, we told him that he couldn't do that, he had filled his pockets again. So now we're home. We're not in the store any longer. We're all the way home. And we've got a lot of these sizes, tags. And I said, Jordan, I said, um, I don't know what we're going to do. Um, but this is very wrong, and, and the store is closed now, and we, we'll have to go back there the next day. And he was the first one in the house. He's a little guy. He was the first one in the house, and for whatever reason, he grabs a spatula, and he comes down, he comes out the door, and while I'm still coming in, 
he, he meets me, he has, holds a spatula, and he says, Dad, is this what you need to do to me? Spank me? And, and he just sat there, and I just looked at him. He, first of all, young kids, that's a great tactic. Because there's no <laughs> way, there's no way that I could spank. I just grabbed him, and I hugged him, and I said, you, you know, but see, I, I hated the fact, in one sense, that he had this idea that this is what it needs to be. As parents, and sometimes there is discipline as parents because we love, but this idea is that our love is always there. We, we want more than anything the relationship. It's what matters more than anything. I was in a small group, leading a small group, a number of years ago. There, um, in this particular group, there were a number of businessmen. One, in particular, very successful. Very successful businessman. And we went around the room, and this was the question. If you could spend time with anyone in this world, an afternoon, who would you choose to do that with? Some people, you know, at the time said, you know, like Billy Graham. I mean, I think I might even have said that. And other people said different things. And finally, it's going around, and it gets to this man. And he says, you know, I'll never forget this. He says, if I could just have an afternoon to spend with my son, that's what I would want. Now, he works with his son. He's the head of the company. His son was also there. And, and when he said that, how I just thought about how what he was saying was how he longed for this relationship. And some of us have that feeling where we, we want that relationship to be better. We want it to be more. Well, God is the same way. He says, I long for you to understand that this is not a religion, that you go through the, you know, the steps and, okay, church on Sunday, and I do these kinds of things. And I don't want it to, it's not, it's not a religion like that. It is a relationship with me. It's all about a relationship. It's about family. It's about that I love you so much. Don't look at me like I'm coming there just to, to get you. The moment you make some mistake, I am there to wrap my arms around you and to love you. That's what I want. I want this relationship with you. So we find out it's in Christ. So when, you, when we understand that and we begin to go to God, which is like I was saying is, you know, when I was saying that when I give that silent treatment, you might say to my wife, if, I, when I, if I'd ever done that, well, not if I ever, when I did, see how it's easy to want to not admit to those things? You see what I'm saying? You know? But when I did, and I sit there, and then when you talk and you begin to work through that, well, that, isn't that so much better? Isn't a good relationship worth it? Isn't it? Is it so much better? But how about that with God? Think about if our relationship with God was something that we could actually, at the end of the day, we would say, you know what, God, it has been awesome today. Thank you for everything that's happened. These are the things that are on my mind and on my heart. If we could begin and begin to see God like that, that it was a relationship, we're not in this religion you know, people say, well, I'm a Christian. I just, I was just with, this week, I was with a group of Muslims. And we were sharing about our faith. And I, I said, you know, I want you to know, they were asking me about Christianity, and I said, I want you to know that I don't even like really, it's not like I mind it, but I said, I don't choose to use the term Christian. Because I said it can mean anything. I, I really like to say that I'm a follower of Jesus. I follow Jesus. I have this relationship. See, I said for us, for me, it's about having a relationship with Jesus. And, and that's really what this is. The enemy will try to break the relationship and keep you in a religion. It's not meant to be that way. It was never meant to be that way. So many Christian people will have a religion of Christianity, truths that they kind of adhere to and believe in, but it was never meant to be that way. That's living at the bare minimum levels of what God has intended for us. It is really an invitation to say, hey, I adopted you. Honest, and God could honestly say this. By the way, nobody else would. But I did, and I did everything. I paid all the expenses. I adopted you. Do you think all I want to do is hammer you every time you make a mistake. No. Didn't I not demonstrate that on the cross? That I'm in love with you, that I want to help you, that I want to give you peace, I want to give you joy. So what would happen if we began each morning 
by thinking about God and talking to, with God with the words that we use, not doing something fancy, just being who we are, not trying to be fake spiritual, just being honestly who we are, and waking up and in, the, in our bed before we ever get out of bed, saying something to God like, thank you for the gift of this day. I got a difficult day and a long day but I want you to be in all of my thoughts. I want you to be present, and I've got this meeting at two o'clock this afternoon, and I know it could be contentious, but God, please help me to remain calm and to be a good leader in that particular meeting. Help me in my marriage. Help me with my kids. And what would happen if we went, we, we did, we just, while we're in bed, we're just starting, we just started in bed, we just had that beginning prayer as we're talking to our best friend, which he is. We're talking to the one who loves us more than anybody else, which he does, you see. What would happen if we began like that? And what would happen when we put our head on the pillow at night if we were to go back over that and say, thank you, and help me to work on this tomorrow, but I appreciate what you've done for me. And, and what would happen if we just knew that, you see, you, would, you know how much money people pay to be with celebrities and there are certain uh, fundraisers? I was just with a guy. Um, he had come up with us, and he said, John, we got to be with some big person from the Cardinals, I think it was. He says, we, we, we were with him for the, the whole um, afternoon. We went to lunch. I bid on this. We got all this. It's a lot of money. The creator of the world has invited all of us to be with him and you have a front row seat and you can be with God all day long so that there's these thoughts that can go on your, in your head. God, I need you. I'm with you. Thank you. You see an ambulance go by. You see a bad accident. God, be with that person. Help them. I mean, because it, it's a relationship, not a religion. You're not just a Christian. You have chosen to be a follower of Jesus because he has adopted us and he went first. Now, just for a moment, let's go back to the shepherds and try to bring this full circle. The shepherds, in hearing that, were never told that they had to go to Bethlehem. They were told that it was in Bethlehem, but it didn't say that you must go. But at the end of that, they had to make a decision. And in every relationship that you have with people, you had to make a decision. Whether it's at work, you, 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 whether it's at work, the people you work with, you have all kinds of decisions. Do I uh, help this person, tell them I'm thinking about them? Do I give them, uh, have this seat? Am I courteous? Am I kind? Do I sit with this person at lunch? You have all kinds of decisions that reflect relationships. So here at the shepherds, they make this decision. They say, let's go. Let's go. Let's go and see this thing. Adam and Eve, when Adam was hi when they were hiding in the garden, and God says, Adam, Eve, where are you? Adam says this, it says this in the scriptures, in Genesis chapter three, it goes, and Adam responded. See, that's the key. God is saying, I'm initiating all of this. I'm initiating it. What would have happened in Iowa State if I wouldn't have got up out of my seat at that Bible study and walked up to this incredibly beautiful woman and said, I just wanted to say hi. What would have happened? Well, I would probably be living in a van, <laughs> eating mushrooms down by the river. You see, you see, somebody had to do something in the relationship, and you're waiting for the response. And thankfully, that turned out really well for me with my wife. But what I'm saying is this, it's no different with God. God is trying to do all of this stuff. And he's waiting for us to respond to that. Now remember I began with those things that we need to put our cell phone down, take time to meet with each other, do all those kinds of things. Remember that? Well, here's the deal. Every one of those things takes time. Every one of the things that the experts tell us to improve a relationship, every one of them takes time. So it should not surprise us that if we're gonna move in 2020 and get a clearer vision of what God wants for us in understanding what we are, that, that it's Jesus that we have to do, that we have to spend time with him. And so I invite you to look at God 
as this one who is so in love with us, who is longing to spend time with us, who is like the father in that small group who says, I just want an afternoon with my son where I can just talk and we can just put all the work aside. I just want that. God is up there saying, I just want to spend some time with you. I just want to be invited into your day. Here I am. I will pursue you till you have no breath left in your lungs. I'll pursue you. Respond to me. So how about if we all decide? It's up to you, obviously. Tonight or today, sometime we just get our thoughts going to God who's in love with us more than we'll ever know. And tomorrow morning when we get up, before we get out of bed, before we get out of bed, we just, lay, we just sit there for a moment. Good morning, God. Thank you so much for this day. Help me live it for you. I know you love me and I love you. You see. Let's begin this year understanding how much God pursues us and how much he's in love with us. And it's a relationship, not a religion. Let's pray. God, I thank you so much for your love and your grace to each of us. It really is a relationship. It's what you've, you've been after the whole time. That's why you use all these terms about family and adopting us. You adopt us even though we have made so many mistakes and sins in our life. But you are so in love with us. Sometimes it's hard to comprehend that. And oftentimes I'm afraid, Lord, that we let the enemy tell us that we really don't matter anymore and that God is mad at us. But you're not. You're just in love with us, God. And you want this relationship. So help us to begin our day and end our day with thoughts of you. Change us and let us know that you are not distant. You're not sitting up there floating around on some cloud, that you're right there in our life. We thank you for that. And we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Well, next week we're on to part two of this series. I think it'll really bless you. Would you stand and greet someone around you? Welcome someone to church today. God bless.